All right. Hi, everybody. I hope that you are doing well um, and that uh, you are having a great day. Um, just so you know, um, I have it currently set up so that I am um, screen recording from my iPad where I have the slides um, and not the Zoom, but I am recording and do plan to post this on YouTube after we're done. Um, so today we're going to be talking about T-cell activation. Before I start talking about T-cell activation, just a quick piece of information about uh, lab. Uh, I got a couple messages from Eileen during lab yesterday and I will admit I was very confused um, because the specific questions uh, people were having trouble with were actually things I knew I had edited out of the lab handout. Um, and when I looked on the lab handout, I saw that an old version was posted and not the new version um, where I had edited some of those things out. So the new edited version is now posted, um, as is the analysis video. Um, I apologize um, for that change. I don't know why my computer was gaslighting me and telling me one version of the document was a different version. Anyway, um, today we're going to be talking about T-cell activation. And this is another way of us thinking about some of these events and time events that are happening um, in the early days after the uh, initiation of antibodies or after we first see antibodies that will lead to um, our adaptive immune response. So again, we're still in this phase of um, between the first infection and when we are getting a good um, T-cell response and trying to figure out what, what events are happening during that time. Um, and we've previously been talking about how we transport the antigen and the T-cells to their specific locations. Um, now we need to actually have the T-cells recognize um, the antigen and start to respond. So that's what we'll be seeing today. This is a really nice image um, from another textbook that talks about the specific details of um, sort of a general idea of what goes on with T cells in the periphery. Um, I think that people, frankly, including immunologists, sometimes forget a couple of things that are um, shown in this figure. Um, so we're going to sort of be coming back to this a few times. Um, you can see that we have an antigen presenting cell that is presenting antigen on MHC to T cells. Um, for ease of making a figure, uh, it's actually presenting on both class one and class two to present to CD8s and CD4s. Um, probably not really presenting to both of them at the same time in real life, but it does make a nice figure. And you'll see that those are labeled as either naive CD8 T cells or naive CD4 T cells. And then those T cells are going to get activated. And those T cells are going to get signals through their T cell receptor. Um, and that is going to lead to um, the cell uh, making some new molecules as is shown here. It's going to lead to the cell proliferating, as is shown here, as clonal expansion. And it's going to lead to the cell differentiating, um, which you can think of as sort of growing up and specializing, or you can think of as gaining new functions. And so the cell that was previously a naive CD4 T cell will now become a helper T cell. Um, the cell that was previously a naive CD8 T cell will now become a cytotoxic T cell. Um, so what you should realize is that this cell, it was not cytotoxic at the beginning when it was naive. It needed this activation and differentiation in response to antigen to become a cytotoxic T cell. Similarly, the naive CD4 T cell was not a helper at the very beginning. Um, it needed this activation and differentiation in order to get that ability to be a helper cell. Um, and I often think about this as 
uh, the fact that it's really important to realize that if that naive CD8 T cell was cytotoxic here right at the beginning, it would have killed that antigen presenting cell and we wouldn't be able to activate any more cells. Um, and that would be kind of useless. So we need to actually have um, this differentiation before we're going to get the cell to be activated. Um, we are going to be really zooming in on this interaction where we actually look at the signals that are happening in order to activate that T cell. And so we are specifically going to be looking at signals that are coming through the T cell receptor. So remember that our T cell receptor, um, which was made by VDJ recombination, is uh, nice and highly specialized to bind to MHC plus peptide, but doesn't really have much in the way of an intracellular domain for signaling. However, it travels with the partner proteins of the CD3 complex, Delta Epsilon, Gamma Epsilon, and Zeta Zeta, each of which have long intracellular domains that contain what are shown here as yellow boxes or ITAMs that have tyrosines to be phosphorylated. Also, when the um, MHC plus peptide comes close to the T cell receptor, um, it can also be bound by CD4 or CD8. In this example, it's CD4 because it's MHC class two. And that will bring a kinase um, in the intracellular portion of the cell in close proximity to all of these ITAMs that are waiting to be phosphorylated. Um, we're going to talk about um, this signaling process in T cells in detail. Um, and largely, we're going to be talking through some of the specific um, details that are shown in figure 811 of your textbook. Although 811, um, as happens with um, many different types of uh, versions of the textbook, um, includes a couple things that I probably won't talk a ton about and also um, doesn't include a couple things that I do want to talk about, but we'll get largely to the same place. Um, because in general, when we think about lymphocyte receptor signaling, whether we're thinking about the T cell receptor as we're talking about today, or whether we think about the B cell receptor, um, we're going to see the same general steps or the same general sets of proteins being activated. So on the left here, you can see either the T cell receptor or the B cell receptor, and the fact that we have kind of the same general set of uh, steps that are um, happening in order to turn on the cell. I could have talked through these exact same types of steps when we talked about B cell activation, but um, we weren't quite ready for that at that part of the semester, so we're going to talk about it with T cells instead. And so, Note that as I'm picking all of the things that one could talk about with T cell receptor signaling, um, I am kind of choosing things that are going to help us see some of these general themes. Um, one other thing to be aware of as we're thinking about the activation of T cells is that in order to fully activate a T cells, a T cell, we generally need that T cell to get multiple signals. One of those signals is from the T cell receptor. Um, and you can see that here, uh, it's generally referred to as signal one. T cells do also need another type of signal um, from co-stimulatory molecules that is often referred to as signal two. Signal two is going to be the topic that we talk about on Monday. Um, I just want you to know that signal 2 exists right now, and that's something that we'll deal with later. T cells also need some uh, cytokine signaling in order for proper activation. Some people refer to that cytokine signaling as signal 3. You'll see a little bit of cytokine signaling today at the end, um, and we'll see a lot more of it um, in another uh, part of next week. Um, so this is actually an actual uh, view from a paper of just the events that happen in the first 10 minutes of T-cell signaling. You can see it's a lot. 
And then this is what happens afterwards. Um, so I am not actually telling you about every single event that happens in T-cell receptor signaling. As I mentioned before, we're really going to be focusing on some of the events that relate to the general themes that I have mentioned. Um, and all of the events that I'm telling you about as part of these general themes with signal one all really relate to helping the T-cell do one big thing as part of its activation process. There are tons of other things that are happening with this activation process, but we largely right now are thinking about one big thing, which is getting the T-cell to transcribe a particular gene called IL-2. In order to get our T-cell activated to transcribe IL-2, the T-cell needs to make or activate or have ready three different transcription factors. Those transcription factors are called NFAT, sometimes known as NFAT, but NFAT is what I'll be calling it, AP1, and NF-kappa B. And so our goal in thinking about T-cell receptor signaling we'll be figuring out how we get from the T-cell receptor to NFAT, to AP1, and to NF-kappa B. Because once you know, their powers are combined, um, they can turn on transcription of this gene IL-2, which is the goal that we're going to be really focused on with signal one. Um, so we start with that T-cell receptor binding to MHC plus peptide. The T cell receptor is only one of many different uh, molecules on the surface of T cells that can be interacting with proteins on the surface of an antigen presenting cell. So for example, we also have adhesion molecules on T cells like the integrins that we talked about last time. Remember that I told you before that the T-cell receptor has relatively low affinity for MHC plus peptide. Um, it needs partner proteins like CD4 and CD8 to help increase the binding strength and stabilize the interaction. In addition, some of these adhesion molecules that have very strong interactions that allowed our cells to stop during T-cell trafficking also can interact with proteins on the surface of the antigen presenting cell to further stabilize this interaction and hold the T-cell in contact with the dendritic cell long enough for the signaling events that we need to have happen. Um, so this is actually showing you another type of view of all of the different types of proteins that are on the surface of both a T-cell and an antigen presenting cell. So you can see that we have our T-cell receptor um, interacting with MHC class 2. You can also see that we've got our CD4, um, in the case of a CD4 T-cell, interacting with MHC class 2. Um, so note here which proteins are on the surface of the T-cell and which proteins are on the surface of the antigen presenting cell. Um, this has been something that I've seen students um, get confused about uh, before. Um, we also have proteins that are involved in signal 2, um, which are shown here and that we'll talk about more on Monday. And we also have a number of proteins like our integrins um, that help stabilize this interaction um, as well. And so those proteins are all shown here. You can also see that those proteins are actually um, organized in the plasma membrane of these different cells. Um, so they're not just randomly wherever, they, act, they will actually um, get into a specific um, order and in specific locations on the plasma membrane. And so if you actually will look at these cell proteins in the surface of the plasma membrane of both the T cell and the antigen presenting cell, you will see that they are organized um, in uh, different um, regions. So um, 
people have you can actually see them with a microscope and with labeling as you can see here it looks kind of like a target with a bullseye um, and that there are two rings of these important signaling proteins that are set up we often refer to them as the CSMAC or the central supramolecular adhesion complex and the PSMAC or the peripheral supramolecular adhesion complex and that um, CSMAC which is this center um, has all of the important parts of signal 1 and signal 2, like the T-cell receptor and CD3 and CD4, CD8, and the COSTIM receptors, while the PSMAC has all of the adhesion molecules that are holding the cells together. So you can see these in um, microscopy images here. You can also see that the PSMAC and CSMAC were um, labeled on this previous slide. Um, we often like to refer to this as the immunological synapse, where our two different cells, in this case our antigen-presenting cell and our T-cell, are interacting. Um, the word synapse is actually a general word in biology to think about the site of interaction between two different cells. Um, we most uh, typically think about it in terms of the neurological synapse. Um, but this is the immunological synapse. I have a lot of um, snarky feelings about why immunologists decided to call it the immunological synapse um, and like to roll my eyes at it, but we'll uh, skip that today and I'll just tell you that this is the immunological synapse. Um, and so you can kind of see um, this here as well, where we can see the um, some of the cells are or some of the proteins are organized in this central ring, and then we have other proteins organized outside of them um, so that we can get all of the stuff we need for signaling really concentrated together. This will also have an important role in what we see with the cell's uh, function. Um, those integrins and uh, other adhesion molecules are going to do something important there, so it's important to sort of realize where they are um, in this peripheral ring around the contact site where the cells are signaling. Um, some of this is actually based on size of these proteins. Um, so there are some proteins that have really big extracellular domains. The most famous one is one called CD45RA. Um, and it actually has such a big um, extracellular domain that it gets excluded from both the CSMAC and the PSMAC. It's just too big to fit into this small area of contact between the T cell and the antigen presenting cell. Um, it turns out that we have learned that um, the um, CD45RA protein is actually uh, involved in negative parts of T cell receptor signaling. So it's kind of cool because it has this giant uh, extracellular protein. It, domain, it gets shoved out of the way during signaling as the two cells get close together, it's, just, it's extracellular domain doesn't fit, and oh my gosh, it can't turn off signaling anymore. Um, so all of this, these sort of physical parts of the interactions um, are pretty uh, critical. Um, so we're going to start looking at the events that are happening downstream of T cell receptor signaling. Um, and so these are really the events that I've already told you about. Sometimes we refer to these events as receptor proximal signaling events because they're happening right when the receptor is first engaged. So they're sort of the first things that are happening in signaling. And so you can see the details of the T-cell receptor proximal signaling here. So originally, our T-cell receptor along with the CD3 proteins was just randomly diffusing around the membrane and was not anywhere near the CD4 protein with the associated LCK. Um, however, when the T cell receptor binds to the MHC plus peptide, that also provides an opportunity for the CD4 protein to bind to the MHC class two in this example. Um, and that brings the associated kinase, LCK, in close proximity to the um, T cell receptor. And so you can see we're bringing LCK into close proximity in both versions of the figure that I have shown here. They're, it's a little bit hard to see because when they draw the figure, they don't draw the proteins as being all that far apart in the first place, but they're brought together even closer. Um, and when they're brought together even closer, 
the LCK protein, which is a kinase. Um, if we're being technically correct, it's not LCK in the case of CD8 T cells, but it's another kinase of the same family. So I don't care if we're calling it LCK. Um, it's technically a any kinase from the SARC family. So it's a SARC family kinase. Um, that kinase will phosphorylate the ITAMs um, on CD3, which you can see here as this addition of pink dots to those ITAMs. This now makes a sort of different biochemical shape and charge um, in those locations in the cell. And because we have this new shape and charge, we now have a new binding site for proteins that wasn't there before. So now proteins could bind to those ITAMs that are phosphorylated that were not able to bind when the ITAMs were not phosphorylated. Um, and in fact, that's exactly what happens. Once we have our phosphorylated ITAMs, we have the binding of a new protein. This protein is called ZAP70. And so you can see ZAP70 um, coming in to phosphorylate in two different views here. ZAP70 is also a kinase. And so now ZAP70 is going to um, come to this location. Um, it couldn't come there before because it didn't have a binding site. And it is now going to start phosphorylating stuff. Again, if we're being technically correct, um, all of the ITAMs were not phosphorylated before and ZAP70 is going to phosphorylate some of them. We don't really care. We're just going to say ZAP70 phosphorylates stuff. Um, including ZAP70 itself getting phosphorylated. So you can see the result of this in figure 810 from your textbook here. Once we have phosphorylated ZAP70, again, we have a new binding site for a protein. And so a new protein that wasn't previously here is going to be able to bind. Um, there are two different proteins that can uh, bind here. They will also be getting some phosphorylations from ZAP70. These two proteins are known as LAT and SLIP76. The really important thing to know about LAT and SLIP76 is less, uh, is, is really what kind of proteins they are, because they are a particular kind of protein in a signaling cascade. And they, in fact, um, sort of take us to the next phase of this signaling process or the next of the general principles. LAT and SLIP76 are proteins that are called adapter proteins. Um, and so, again, we can say that we're generally at this phase of adapter protein recruitment. So we're going to get LAT and SLIP76, our adapter proteins, um, recruited to this area as well as being phosphorylated. Um, and I really like the image at the bottom here to help us think about adapter proteins. So our adapter proteins can get phosphorylated. Here you can see a green adapter protein and then that green adapter protein getting phosphorylated. Um, the adapter protein um, listed here as a scaffold um, is just like um, the adapter that I might use when I go to South Africa um, to plug in my uh, devices. South Africa has different kinds of plugs than we have in the United States. Um, and so I have to use a little device that plugs into the um, electrical outlets so that I can plug in my, um, my computer. That little device that I plug in is called an adapter, and it doesn't actually do anything to the electricity. It just sort of has the matching plug parts um, for me to plug into another uh, type of outlet. So in similar ways, adapter proteins have no enzymatic activity themselves. They don't do anything. They just provide a way for us to change to different kinds of signals.
you can think of them as a really big meeting place for a whole bunch of different proteins. So we can start all of those proteins um, signaling. And so again, all of the adapters doing is getting phosphorylated and then being a place where lots of other proteins can now bind. Um, so those proteins that were previously not near each other in the cell now can become near each other and start to interact. Um, the green protein itself is actually not doing anything other than just sitting there and being an interaction site. And so that's what an adapter protein is. And in fact, that is exactly what both SLIP76 and LAT do, is that SLIP76 and LAT are just proteins that get phosphorylated and allow a lot of other types of proteins to come together um, to interact and to start their signaling uh, process. What you can see um, from this figure and what you'll see from later figures as well is that once we get signaling through LAT and SLIP76, so we've basically had LCK phosphorylate the ITAMs, then we've turned on ZAP70, then we've turned on, I have no idea why I'm getting a phone call, um, then we've turned on um, SLIP76 and LAT, um, now we're going to have signaling that's going to go in a few different branches. And so we're going to think about um, what's happening in some of these different branches. Um, what we'll do is we'll go down a branch until we get to the point of transcription. Um, and then we'll come back to SLIP76 and LAT again and go down a different branch um, to look at um, the step, those steps of signaling. Um, and so here we're going to see our first signal transduction pathway um, that's happening downstream of um, LAT and SLIP76. And this pathway is known as the RAS MAP kinase pathway. Um, so first, um, I want to tell you a couple of things about the RAS MAP kinase pathway and explain the RASMAP kinase pathway to you. Um, so in the RASMAP kinase pathway, we are often thinking about um, changes in the cell that allow the cell to eventually do some proliferation. Um, there are lots of other things we now know that this, per this does, but originally when we learned about RASMAP-K, we were thinking about proliferation. Um, and so when we think about proliferation, I'm going to be, try to be sneaky here. Um, yeah, we'll do it this way. When we think about proliferation, we can think about calling that mitosis. Mitosis, you might imagine, happens because we have something called a mitogen, sorry, a mitosis activating protein or a MAP. So we're going to have some protein that is going to activate mitosis. Um, we can generally think of that protein as being called a MAP. There is no actual protein called MAP, um, but this helps us understand what's going on in this pathway. Um, so our mitosis activating protein, or MAP, gets turned on by phosphorylation. If you are going to imagine the name of a protein that is turned on by phosphorylation, uh, or that, that activates MAP and that does this phosphorylation. So imagine who's going to do the phosphorylation of MAP. And you are in charge of biology. What would you name the protein that phosphorylates MAP? Michael. Michael. 
Would it be the map kinase? I might call it map kinase. Because it's going to phosphorylate map. And in fact, that is correct. That what is really what it was named. It turns out that the map kinase is activated by phosphorylation. If you were in charge of the world and you needed to name the protein that phosphorylated MAP kinase, what would you name the protein that phosphorylates MAP kinase? Michael. MAP kinase kinase? Michael would name this protein MAP kinase kinase and Michael would be correct. So this protein is actually known as MAP kinase kinase. It turns out that MAP kinase kinase is activated by phosphorylation. If you were in charge of the world and you had to name the protein that phosphorylated MAP kinase kinase, what would you name that protein? Michael. Map uh, kinase kinase kinase. Ma Michael would name that protein map kinase kinase kinase, and Michael would be correct that this protein is known as map kinase kinase kinase. Map kinase 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 is not generally active and needs to be activated by another protein. Um, map kinase 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 is activated by another protein. And the name of that protein is RAS. You now know the entire RAS MAP kinase pathway. Um, and so usually this is one that people actually have a pretty easy time remembering when they um, really look at the details of this pathway. And so um, RAS is one of the things that is turned on um, by um, activation of the adapters, SLIP76 and LAT. In reality, there are multiple MAP kinase 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 proteins in the cell that have been discovered, um, as well as um, multiple MAP kinase kinases, multiple MAP kinases, and multiple um, proteins that activate mitosis. Um, that are really transcription factors um, that, are, that have been described. Um, the most famous um, MAP kinase kinase kinase, and in fact the one that is really activated in this process is known as RAF. Um, the MAP kinase kinase that's important in this process is known as MEC. The MAP kinase in this pathway is known as ERK, and ERK turns on a particular transcription factor known as FOS. Um, and so the specific names of the proteins in this pathway um, are RAS, RAF, MEC, ERK, um, which turns on FOS. There is another important MAP kinase um, besides ERK in this pathway, which is known as JNK or JUNK. Um, JUNK turns on a different um, MAP, not FOS. It turns on one called June. Once FOSS and June are together, um, again, their powers are combined. I guess we have a lot of Captain Planet today. Um, I'm really dating myself with that reference. Um, FOSS and June combined make a transcription factor known as AP1. If you go back to the original um, slide I showed you where our goal of making IL-2, one of the transcription factors that we needed to make IL-2 was AP1. And so you can see AP1 um, activation through the RAS MAP kinase pathway, um, all because SLIP and LAT76 
um, were activated, allowing RAS to come to that location and become activated. Our second big pathway that happens following um, RAS and SLIP76 um, activity is turning on a protein called PLC gamma. Um, your textbook focuses a fair amount on the PLC gamma pathway, um, which is particularly important um, for immunologists in, for a number of reasons. And so we're going to be thinking about um, going back up to LAT and SLIP76 here and looking at the PLC gamma um, pathway. Um, PLC gamma stands for phospholipase C gamma. If you see the name phospholipase, um, what do you think that pho a phospholipase does? I'll give you a hint. It has ACE in its name, so it must be an enzyme. What do you think this enzyme does? Would it, would it like have to do something with like hydrolyzation? Okay, so uh, Karame points out that it has something to do with hydrolyzation and it does. Um, so it is going to break something down um, or hydrolyze something. But we can actually also get into specifically what type of molecule it might hydrolyze. What type of molecule might phospholipase cleave? Mike, oh, Carney. Phospholipid. A phospholipid, exactly. So a phospholipase is going to cleave a phospholipid. Um, and phospholipase C gamma cleaves a particular phospholipid. Um, phospholipase C gamma cleaves um, something known as PI45 bisphosphate. Um, its structure is shown here. I always know of this protein or this phospholipid as PIP2. Um, I never think about PI45 bisphosphate or its structure, um, but um, phospholipase C specifically cleaves PIP2. Um, you can see that PIP2 has part that's in the membrane with these long lipid tails and this uh, head group. And when phospholipid or phospholipase C gamma, PLC gamma, cleaves PIP2, it cleaves it into two products, one of which is known as 1,2-diacylglycerol, generally referred to as DAG, and you can see that it still has those long phospholipid uh, tails. Um, and another one is um, mostly this head group, um, inositol 145-triphosphate, or IP3. Um, and both IP3 and DAG can have some um, events downstream in the signaling. Um, the one that is more famous to most immunologists is IP3. And so we're going to follow IP3 first. Um, DAG also has some important events. And I have to admit, um, the fact that this version of your textbook actually talks about DAG um, warms my heart a little bit because I always feel bad for DAG that we kind of don't really talk about it um, a lot. So I'm glad that the DAG is going to get its due today. It's not just going to be IP3. Um, so IP3 is going to be made, as is DAG, um, by phospholipase C, and remember phospholipase C was activated by the LAT and SLIP76 um, activation. So once IP3 um, is released, it's going to bind to a protein. If you were in charge of the world, what would you name the protein that IP3 binds to? Michael. Would it be IP3 binding protein? You might call it the IP3 binding protein. Um, let's say you didn't, let's say binding protein was too many words and you wanted to put, get one word instead of two. 
I might call it the IP3 receptor. Um, and in fact, the next thing that's going to happen is that IP3 is going to bind to its I, the IP3 receptor. And the IP3 receptor lives on the endoplasmic reticulum. So you can see the IP3 receptor, um, you can see IP3 being made as well as DAG um, by PLC gamma here. And the key thing here are the small blue dots. If you look at the figure on the left, you can see that the gray area, which is the cytoplasm, has no blue dots to start with. The cells regulate the blue dots, which are calcium, very, very, very tightly. The cell does not have any free calcium in the cytoplasm. There's all sorts of mechanisms that keep free calcium out of the cytoplasm. Um, when IP3 binds to the IP3 receptor, the result is that calcium leaves the ER where it had been stored. So note that the calcium is originally in the ER. Um, the calcium will leave the ER um, through a channel. So basically the channel just opens and the calcium moves from area of high concentration to area of low concentration um, by diffusion. But we now have this flood of calcium in the cytoplasm that we did not previously have. So IP3 is going to lead to this calcium release from the ER. Um, you can see the same thing in this figure, that IP3 interacts with the ER, and now we flood the cell full of calcium, which was not previously there. Um, many cell types use calcium for important signaling events. Those of you who have taken different classes in neuroscience will be very familiar with calcium signaling. Um, because calcium signaling is a pretty big thing in um, neurons. Um, we, as I said, ha originally have no uh, calcium in the cytoplasm, and there are a bunch of proteins that can bind to calcium if it is there. So they're kind of, you can think of them as sort of calcium sensors. Um, one of those proteins is known as calmodulin. So when calcium is present, calcium will bind calmodulin, as you can see here, and that will activate calmodulin so that it can uh, activate and turn on some other proteins. Um, you can see calmodulin um, binding to calcium in this figure as well. So originally, we had no calcium in the cytoplasm, the calcium was only in the ER, so you see no blue dots in the gray area of the cytoplasm. Once IP3 binds to the IP3 receptor on the ER, calcium floods out of the ER and goes into the cytoplasm, and those small blue dots of calcium will bind to calmodulin. Um, you can see calmodulin at the beginning, this green protein, um, was uh, sort of all, fold, all folded up, and it um, will then bind to calcium if calcium is available. That gives it a conformational change, which at least according to this book, so it means it turns into a wrench. Um, and that allows for um, calmodulin to interact with other important proteins. Um, the protein that's really important for us is one called calcineurin. Um, so you can see calcineurin is activated by calmodulin. When calcineurin is activated, it will um, interact with this other protein, NFAT. NFAT has been around all along, but NFAT was covered by phosphate groups. You can see those pink dots of the phosphate groups on NFAT. And those phosphate groups make it so that NFAT is not allowed to go to the nucleus and be a transcription factor. It cannot fulfill its whole potential of being a transcription factor because it is being held outside the nucleus by these phosphate groups. You can imagine them sort of hiding the um, 
localization signal that may, in fact, go into the nucleus. When calcineurin um, is active, it is able to remove the phosphate groups from NFAT. And NFAT can then move into the nucleus where it can start to activate transcription. When we looked at those signal transduction proteins earlier, um, and we talked about IL-2 and our need to um, transcribe IL-2, the second of the three transcription factors we needed was NFAT. So you can see AP1 with the RASMAP kinase pathway, and you can see NFAT um, downstream of IP3 and calcium release in the cells. This is probably one of the most famous signaling cascades to most immunologists. The reason why this uh, cascade is particularly famous to most immunologists is because we have a drug that specifically can block this cascade. And this drug is known as cyclosporin A. This was sort of the first big immunosuppressive drug that was ever described. Um, it can be used in general for immunosuppression, um, particularly to stop T cell activation. And um, this drug, in fact, made it possible for um, us to really start to be able to do organ transplants. So before cyclosporin A, um, organ transplantation rarely happened or barely existed. Um, cyclosporin A is really what allowed us to do transplantation, and it acts on the, some of the exact proteins that I was telling you about, which is why it's important to know about them for immunology and why most immunologists know about them. So you can see on the left what normally happens uh, in the cell. So calcium will be released from the ER into the cytoplasm. This will activate calmodulin, um, which can then activate calcineurin, um, which can remove the phosphates from NFAT so that NFAT can go to the nucleus and activate transcription. Um, however, um, if cyclosporin A is present, so if our patient has been treated with this drug, cyclosporin A, cyclosporin A is able to get in between calcineurin and calmodulin. So what will happen here is we'll still have LCK phosphorylate ITAMs. We'll still activate ZAP70 in these T cells. We'll still activate SLIP76 and um, LAT. We'll still do the whole RAS map kinase pathway to make AP1. We'll still do the other pathway that I've not yet told you about. Um, we'll still make IP3. We'll still get calcium. We'll still get calcineurin. But then everything's going to stop. That calcineurin is going to hang out in the cell wanting, or sorry, the calmodulin is going to hang out in the cell. It's going to want to turn on calcineurin. It's going to try so hard, and it's going to be able to do nothing because cyclosporin A is going to get in the middle of that interaction. And so we're never going to be able to turn on NFAP. We're never going to release or remove the phosphate groups from NFAT. We're never going to allow NFAT into the nucleus for transcription. It will be stuck in the cytoplasm forever. And as a result, we're never going to get our T cell activated. And so in our patient who maybe had T cells that were going to kill the kidney, uh, the transplanted kidney, those T cells are no longer active, can't kill the transplanted kidney. Similarly, if we had T cells that were part of um, an autoimmune disease, um, those T cells would be uh, stopped in their tracks because they could not ever activate NFAT. So they could not get all three of the transcription factors they needed to turn on IL-2. And like I said, this is a really, really famous drug in immunology. 
um, which is why it's important that we talk about the details of this signaling pathway. Oops. Um, so the third pathway that we're going to talk about takes us back to SLIP76 and um, LAT, and in fact also takes us back to PLC gamma, um, our phospholipase that cleaved um, a phospholipid, PIP2, into two different products. One of those products we just saw was IP3 that bound to the IP3 receptor to lead to calcium release. And the other one of those protein, of those uh, small molecules that was made is DAG, or diacylglycerol. Diacylglycerol, DAG, um, can lead to further signaling to turn on a protein called PKC theta. Um, it's a protein kinase. And that protein kinase will phosphorylate our final transcription factor, NF-kappa B, um, so that that final transcription factor, NF-kappa B, can move into the nucleus and turn on um, IL-2. And so this is the entire process that we just talked through, where we have um, our T-cell receptor um, binding MHC plus peptide along with uh, CD4 or CD8. Um, that brings our Sark family kinase, LCK, into close proximity um, of the ITAMs um, so they can be phosphorylated. This gives us a docking site for ZAP70. Um, ZAP70 also gets phosphorylated. Um, this further gives us docking sites for LAT and SLIP76, which get phosphorylated. They allow activation of many proteins, one of which is RAS, um, that will turn on the MAP kinase cascade, and that will give us one transcription factor, AP1. LAT and SLIP76 also provide a binding site for PLC gamma so that it can become activated to cleave PIP2. PIP2 um, is cleaved into IP3 and DAG. IP3 leads to calcium release from the ER that signals through calmodulin and calcineurin, finally turning on the transcription factor NFAP. And PIP2 also leads to the production of DAG, which signals um, to allow for the activation of the transcription factor NF-kappa B. And now all three of those transcription factors are able to go to the nucleus um, to transcribe IL-2, which if you recall, I told you was the goal of this whole signaling process. So we have achieved the goal um, downstream of our T-cell receptor uh, activation. Go us. Um, so there are, of course, a lot of other pieces to T-cell activation, um, some of which we'll deal with next week, but there's one other piece that I'll point out a little bit about today. That has to do with the fact that there is a fair amount of cytokine signaling that is important in activation of T-cells. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that cytokine signaling um, right now, specifically because we're going to talk about IL-2. Remember that our goal in turning on our T-cell was to transcribe this gene, IL-2, which of course will lead to the trans. Uh, after we have mRNA from transcription of IL-2, we'll get some translation of IL-2, and we'll get the IL-2 protein. That was our goal all along. So what the heck does the IL-2 protein do? Um, IL-2 is a protein that um, is a cytokine, uh, as you might guess from um, the IL interleukin in its name. Um, but it was originally described as T-cell growth factor. Um, it was actually originally called TCGF um, before we really understood it as a cytokine called IL-2. And IL-2 um, is really important for allowing a T-cell to go through mitosis and divide and make many other cell types, as well as for our cell to um, acquire new functions as I'd mentioned before. So our cell is also going to differentiate when it receives um, some IL-2. 
as you might guess, IL-2 signals through um, something known as the IL-2 receptor. And when we look closely at the IL-2 receptor, we find that it has three different protein chains that come together. One of them is known as IL-2 receptor alpha. One of them is known as IL-2 receptor beta. Um, and the other one is uh, known as gamma. And IL-2 was the first described member of a group of cytokines called the gamma chain family of cytokines. They all use the same gamma protein paired with other proteins in order to make their receptor. So this includes IL-15, IL-7, IL-9, IL-4, and not shown here, IL-21. Um, this is an incredibly important family of cytokines. And one of the reasons why um, these cytokines are so important um, is that there is a disease where um, there are patients who have a mutation in the gamma chain, so they don't make the gamma chain. And that means that they can't do the IL-2 receptor signaling that we're going to talk about. So you might guess they have uh, T cells that aren't going to be activated well. But they also can't do IL-15 receptor signaling or IL-7 receptor signaling or IL-9 receptor signaling or IL-4 receptor signaling or IL-21 receptor signaling. Um, you've seen IL-7 earlier this semester in terms of um, its importance in turning on um, the survival program of developing B and T cells. So not only could we not activate T cells, we actually can't really even develop them in the first place in, if we don't have the gamma chain. Um, so patients who don't have the common gamma chain have this disease SCID or severe combined immunodeficiency. They have no T cells, they have no B cells, they have no NK cells because of one of these other cytokines, and they have some really severe uh, issues with their immune system. The common gamma chain is encoded on the X chromosome, so this is an X-linked disease um, and is, most, is very frequently found in boys. Um, and some of them you can see have uh, two chains in their receptor, though IL-2 has three chains, alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, and in different combinations, those proteins can bind to the IL-2 cytokine with different affinities. If just alpha is present, and we're not really going to talk much about this situation, maybe a little next week, um, it can bind to IL-2 with low affinity. If we have just beta and gamma, we have sort of medium affinity for IL-2. But if we have all three proteins together, we have high affinity interaction for IL-2. At the beginning, our naive T cell just has beta and gamma, so it can bind IL-2 with um, low affinity. As that T cell gets activated, it starts to make the alpha chain and make a higher affinity receptor for IL-2. So naive T cells can drink up a little bit of IL-2. Um, and in fact, one of the things that happens when they start to do that is they make the alpha chain so they can drink up more IL-2. Um, and get more growth factor so they can proliferate more and differentiate more. Um, and so here you, here you can kind of see the specific details of the IL-2 receptor signaling um, in uh, the cells, in, in our T cells. So what you can see is that our naive T cell um, has some low affinity um, IL-2 receptor, just the beta and gamma chains. When that cell gets activated, that cell starts to make IL-2. You can see the IL-2 being made here. That IL-2 actually binds to the IL-2 receptor. Um, and pretty early, we also get signals to make the alpha chain to get more IL-2. And so this cell is actually feeding itself IL-2 to tell itself, yes, you can proliferate. When this is happening, there are usually a few T cells in the same location. And so the IL-2 um, made by one T cell will both potentially activate itself um, in what's known as autocrine signaling, but also will activate all of the 
friend T cells that happen to be in that same location. It's not going to diffuse far. It's not going to turn on all the T cells in the body, but other T cells that are starting this process at the same antigen presenting cell may also get some IL-2 in paracrine. So now we're going to start to get um, T cell proliferation. Um, so this is in some ways the what we see with um, signal two. It's one of, you can see an autocrine um, IL-2 uh, being made by the T cell and signaling that cell to help that cell get further activated. Um, you could also imagine another cell nearby getting activated by that IL-2. Um, that will be important for uh, turning on our um, T cell properly. Um, we'll see many more cytokines um, that are involved in cytokine signaling next week. In general, when we talk about cytokines and think about cytokine signaling, um, we also see some pretty um, conserved signaling uh, processes that are happening with cytokine signaling. So cytokine receptors um, will are bound to a particular type of protein known as a JAK. Um, when these proteins were originally described, um, they were also described um, in some patients who had SCID, but who had perfectly fine uh, gamma chain receptors. So people started looking for other proteins that were involved. Um, they originally, they found this protein, Jack. They were so excited. They thought it was, you know, some new important protein in T-cell biology and it was going to be the coolest thing ever. And then they decided it was lame um, because it was just another kinase, um, which is at least what old school immunologists tell me Jack stood for. Um, Jack, now, we now say that Jack stands for Janus kinase um, because Janus was a roaming god with two faces um, and Jacks have two really important um, domains one of which is the kinase domain that allows them to phosphorylate things. Um, the other is a domain that actually allows them to bind to things when they are phosphorylated. Um, so you can see originally our cytokine receptor might be in different chains. It might be diffusing separately around the cell. Um, when cytokine binds, it brings the receptor in close proximity. Now the jacks are in close proximity and they can phosphorylate each other and also have some important binding sites, and they will bind to a group of proteins known as the STATs. The STATs stand for signal transducer and activator of transcription. Um, so when our jacks are active, they bind STATs, and they activate the stats. When stats have been phosphorylated, they're able to bind together, and then they themselves can go to the nucleus and actually be the transcription factor. So we don't need any more proteins, we don't need any more transcription factors. The stats themselves both transduce the signals as signal transducer and are transcription factors as activators of transcription. All cytokines that we know of signal through this pathway, the JAK stat pathway, which involves only Jack and Stat, so it's again one that a number of different that students tend to really like because um, it's pretty easy to remember what's in the Jack Stat pathway. The answer is Jack and Stat, um, and there are technically multiple types of Jack and multiple types of Stat, but we don't really need to worry about that now. Um, so that um, those aspects of turning on T cell activation largely through signal one but also how that can give us some cytokine signaling were the points that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, on um, Monday, we'll talk about some additional aspects of turning on T cells, particularly t the details of signal two, which is what we need to fully turn on T cells. Um, and I will see you all back in person on Monday. Uh, thank you for putting up with a Zoom class, um, and I hope that you have a great weekend.